affliction and reproach, the wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, this morning, the Bible classes that we had. We thank you, Lord, for all the wonderful things that we have learned already from your word. And we are excited, dear Lord, to learn more um, during the Sunday school in the worship service. I pray, Lord, that you give wisdom to those who will be standing behind the pulpit. I pray, Lord, that you give us uh, more understanding of your word and how to apply it, dear Lord, in our lives. I pray that uh, everyone who will be listening will be uh, humble enough to uh, submit to your word and to be able, dear Lord, to uh, see how uh, to improve our Christian life, our faith, dear Lord, by using the word of God. Apart from it, we know that we can never grow, we can never learn, and that uh, I pray, Lord, that we will wholly follow and, and submit ourselves to the word of God. I pray that you help us as we uh, help me, dear Lord, as I teach. I pray, Lord, that the things that I have studied will be, uh, I will remember them in order to be able to teach the people. I pray that the Holy Spirit will work freely in our midst and challenge us this morning. For all these things, I pray in His name. Amen. Thank you very much. Um, you may be seated. And I'll, I'll get straight to it because um, we have limited time in our Sunday school. So now, um, I, I, I have prayed uh, about uh, preaching through Nehemiah, but, and, and I know it's very difficult because I'm not used to preaching uh, from the Old Testament. This is the uh, expertise of uh, preacher Wilson. But I'm not really, really uh, used to preaching from the Old Testament. But uh, as a preacher, we must be able to use the Word of God and to preach uh, the Word of God. So now, uh, I've been, this Nehemiah is my daily uh, reading, uh, Bible reading. And I read through it very slowly because I see that uh, as you read through the book of Nehemiah, a lot of things you can apply in our lives. And this morning, we are going to study on how to respond to uh, uh, bad news and how to respond to bad, bad news uh, properly. So now, uh, for, for a way of our learning, we are going to look at the background of Nehemiah and it's very important to understand this background, uh, to know this background, to be able to understand the book itself. And if we don't know the background of Nehemiah, it's very, uh, we are going to miss a lot of uh, uh, principles that we can apply in our lives. Now, Nehemiah was written at around 430 BC. So now this is around 2,400 years ago or more. Okay, and even though it's written so long ago, we can still see a lot of practical insights that apply to us even today. Um, we are we do preach that we don't get uh, uh, all our faith and practice in the Old Testament, and we don't. We don't. We get our faith and practice through the epistles that are written to us, but we do get a lot of uh, precious principles in the book of in the old testament principles on how men of god lived especially knowing that they lived in a time when a lot of uh, there are a lot of idolatry around them a lot of uh, opposing people and the fact is they don't have the bible with them and how were they able to, to surpass that how were they able to live through those times of idolatry and, and being killed and being opposed uh, without having the Bible. And that's why we're so blessed today that we have a complete Word of God. We're so blessed that we can open the Bible and look at the principles of the Word of God in order to apply in our lives. When people here, like Nehemiah, uh, do not have the Word of God. They only have the first five books, the Law of Moses. That's all they had. That's all they had to go on. But now we have everything complete from Genesis to Revelation to read and apply in our lives. That's why we're so blessed. Now here in the book of Nehemiah, we can learn that, uh, we can learn a, a lot of things. We can learn what is God's will in our lives, how to know God's will in our lives, and how to uh, accomplish God's will in our lives. We can also know how to recognize problems. This is something that pastors and preachers should have. Nehemiah was a leader. Even though he was uh, just a cupbearer, but God raised him up to be a leader of Israel. And one of the skills he had was he knows how to recognize problems. That is something that is lacking with a lot of leaders. We don't discern problems that are arising in congregations. That's why a good leader must be able to recognize a problem. All right? And then uh, uh, deal with it biblically. All right, something that we can learn here as well. We can learn on how to effectively lead others. And here in the book of Nehemiah, we will learn that if we can only effectively lead others to Christ, 
or to the will of God if we ourselves are leaders or, or are believers who are sub submitted to the word of God or to the will of God in our lives. And we are going to learn how to deal with problems like criticism, ridicule, slander, discouragement, fear, all of these things. How do we respond to them? How do we deal with them? And this personally this is such a blessing to me because uh, uh, I'm very immature in dealing with these things. Right? I'm very emotional. I get mad a lot and a lot, a lot of these things. But then we see how Nehemiah deal with this. It's such a blessing. And how we can have revival in our lives. These things we can apply in our lives by reading the book of Nehemiah. And a lot of things that I will be saying, you can have that just by reading the word of God. Just by sitting down, reading, analyzing, meditating upon the Word of God, you can have all these blessings in your life every day just by reading through this book. Now, here in this book, Nehemiah is presented in three different ways. Now, uh, earlier in his life, uh, in, 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 in uh, the book, we can see him as a cupbearer. Now, a cupbearer is a very uh, 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 a privileged, uh, what do you call this, although dangerous, uh, uh, what they call this uh, 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 occupation, but he's privileged nonetheless, just by being in the palace and being with the king. He has all these privileges, but then after that, he became a builder of the wall. He led the people to build the wall. And after that, he became the governor of that city, right, to lead the people. So now, we'll see how he dealt with all those things. And we're going to look at the events that leading up to this book. Now, we know that Israel prospered under Saul, David, and Solomon. Right, they were prosperous. They were, uh, we know their story. Not always prosperous. Right? There were times there, was up, there were uh, ups and downs. But basically, they were, uh, um, what they call this, generally, they were prosperous. They were a nation that are feared by other nations. They're a nation that, uh, that other people look at them and see the power of God. They see, they respect them. They don't really have that, uh, uh, what they call this, audacity to really oppose the people of God. Uh, in, during the time of Saul, David, and Solomon. But at the end of Solomon's reign, they started to compromise. They started to uh, uh, do these things that are outside the will of God, led by a leader who was compromising himself. You know, a leader can lead a church to the will of God, and a leader can lead a church to a life of compromise as well. So now Solomon did this. He compromised with the relationships, uh, uh, with his re because of his relationships with his many, many wives. He had to compromise with serving their gods as well. So now because of this, because of this, God gave judgment to Israel, right? Because a compromise will never go unpunished. Compromise or sin or doing things against the will of God will never go unpunished by, the word, by, by God. You will be chastised by God. You will uh, have problems. God will make you know that what you're doing is wrong. So God judged them by a way that when Solomon died, the kingdom got divided. There was a civil war. Civil war between the northern and then the southern kingdom. The southern being composed of, though of um, uh, no, the northern uh, the southern being composed of Judah and Benjamin, and the rest were, were, were having a war with them. Now, God judged these northern tribes, all right, by having Assyria invade Israel and take uh, Israel into captive, captivity. Now, this started a lot of bad things happening to Israel. God's judgment to a people who are compromising the will of God in their lives, right? Imagine Israel, people who saw the power of God with their own eyes, people who saw the provision of God, wonderful provisions of God, right? A, a water coming out of a rock, manna coming down from heaven, and all of these things. Israel saw that with their own eyes and still compromised their faith, still compromised uh, what God has told them to do, and God judged them. All right, by putting them into a captivity. Now, this is something that can apply in our lives. If we compromise, if we don't stand for what is right, if we, for the sake of friendship, for the sake of relationship, compromise the truth of God's word, we are going to be a bond, uh, uh, what they call this prisoner of that compromise. Because one compromise will lead you to another and another and another, and then, uh, and then you find yourself at the end of your life compromising. From, from the beginning until the, the moment that you die. And you are going to face the Lord with that compromise. And God is going to judge you. Right? And then uh, when, when Assyria did that, King Nebuchadnezzar came into the scene and he invaded Judah three times, three invasions, and then took the people into captive. Let's read Second Chronicles chapter 36, verse 18 to 19. 
2 Chronicles 36, 18 to 19. The Bible says, And all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, this talking about the temple of God, the, the one that Solomon built, the wonderful temple, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king, and of his princes, all this he brought to Babylon. Right? They sold everything. And what did they do with the rest? And they burnt the house of God. And they break down the wall of Jerusalem and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. Now, now what happened was a, great, uh, was a great loss, was a tragic event that God and, and all these enemies burned the house of God. All these enemies destroyed the house of God. When a church starts applying, right, we're always applying it to our time. When a church starts to compromise, we know that the church is the body of Christ. We are making the enemy destroy the body of Christ, make fun of the body of Christ. I really, just really, uh, how do you call this, uh, uh, slander the, 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 the body of Christ. And they will just say that uh, uh, this, uh, this is just a bad testimony as a church if we continue to compromise. And now they were brought to Babylon and were in captivity there for 70 years. Now, a lot of things happened, like the story of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. For 70 years, God was still faithful to raise up men in certain times, just at the right time, to be able to preserve Israel. Now, they were not completely destroyed. Now, even though they're under God's judgment, God was still preserving them. Right? That is the faithfulness of God. Now, even though we do compromise, even though we do disobey God and we're outside the will of God, yes, a harm may come, to our, come our way. Yes, we may be punished by God, but God, being a faithful and loving Father, will still, will still be there to help us, to guide us, right? But it's not a good life to live. It's not a pleasant life to live. Just, just looking at your own family, if you live a life disobey, disobeying your parents and you're still dependent on them, it will not be a good life to live. They will not throw you into the streets. They will not kill you. But you will not have the privileges that you, you, you might have if you are do, obeying the Lord. Now, after 70 years, it is key to understanding uh, uh, all of these things because it's key to understand the book of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther because all of these things are connected. Now, during the captivity, let's read how uh, the, 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 the state of Israel in Psalms chapter 137. Now, this psalm was written during that time in Babylon. It says here, and I'll just read it quickly. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept. When we remembered Zion. Okay? We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For they, their day that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. Right? Being mocked. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Or how shall we properly worship the Lord when we are in the midst of this strange land, wicked people? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem, who said, Raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed? Happy shall he be that, uh, that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. Now, these people here in uh, captivity under Babylon, they were not enjoying their lives. Right? Even though some of them were given privileges, we know that, we, we read the uh, Old Testament and we see that. But then, generally, the people of God were not in the will of God. And eventually, uh, into, that, into that captivity at Babylon, they realized that. They realized, we were, do, we, were commit, we were committing a mistake. We should not be here. We remember the promised land. We remember the time when we were blessed. We remember the time we had sweet fellowship with God. And this is not the place for us. A person, like comparing it to a person who is backslidden. You will never be happy in a backslidden state. You will never be happy in a state of disobeying God continually in your life. If you're really saved. A person who's really saved. A, a child of God. A son of God will not be happy living a life of disobedience. We might, we might enjoy the pleasures of this world for a while. We might enjoy it for a while because that's what we wanted. 
Uh, that's why we bashed it. But eventually, like the prodigal son, you will realize that being in the will of God is so much better than what this world can offer. Being in the will of God is so much better than what all, all these pleasures can promise you. All these passing pleasures in the world uh, is, is so much inferior to what the Lord has in store for us. And of course, we know that heaven is there, uh, something that God has in store for us. But we can have a taste of that by being in the will of God, by God, by, by God blessing us when we are doing His will. Now, Babylon eventually fell to Persia, all right? The ending the captivity at Babylon. And, and the, the king who defeated Babylon was King Cyrus. Now, this king was gentle with Israel, not like uh, uh, Babylon. He was gentle. And God used this king, an unbeliever, now, God can use even an unbeliever for the people of God. God used this king in order to, to issue a decree to build the temple so that the foundation will be laid again in Jerusalem. All right, now, the Jews went back to the Jerusalem by the leadership of three men. Zerubbabel, Ezra, eight years later, and 13 years later, Nehemiah. Now, the, the, the temple was completed at around 516 BC, all right? Remember, Jerusalem was destroyed, temple burnt, walls were torn down. But then the temple, through Cyrus and, and uh, uh, people of God, uh, uh, allowed them to rebuild the temple of Jerusalem. But they were never allowed to rebuild the wall, just the temple. They were never allowed to rebuild the wall. If we go to the book of Esther, King Asawerus um, allowed Esther to be even beautify the temple. Right, because he, he took Esther to be his wife, right? So he allowed Esther, by Esther's uh, uh, passion for the people of God, remember God always raising up people at the right time, right? To fulfill His will. Even though He, he, put, them, uh, he put them under His judgment, He slowly bringing them back to His will. Slowly bringing them back to Jerusalem by using these people and even unbelievers like King Cyrus. Now, He allowed Asawerus to have a soft heart for Esther, his wife, in order to beautify the temple, but not rebuild the wall they were never allowed to rebuild the wall and they tried a few times but failed and and and, and because of lack of uh, what they call this lack of uh, resolve now even though when they were building the temple it took them a long time why remember when they were building the wall uh, people starting to started to oppose them even though the king allowed them people started to oppose them and as soon as people opposed these people this Israelite they stopped they just stopped. And until it took uh, Haggai and Zechariah to rebuke them, and after those, that rebuke, we, can, we don't have time to go there, after Haggai and Zechariah rebuked them, four years after that, they were able to build the temple. And the temple was beautified by Esther, but again, never allowed to rebuild the wall. Now, Ezra tried to rally the people to rebuild the wall, but again, they lack resolve. You know, this is the problem with us today. We lack resolve. Even though we try to build on something, we try to do something, we try to accomplish something for God, the moment we are faced with opposition, we stop. Why? We lack resolve. We don't have the determination to do it, whatever happens. To keep on doing the will of God, whatever it takes, I'm going to do it. They like this. Now it took the leadership of Nehemiah to be there, rally them, revive them, encourage them, give them courage using the Word of God and lead them to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Now, it takes us now to the time of Nehemiah. Nehemiah arrived in Jerusalem uh, a few decades after uh, Esther uh, 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 beautifying the temple. Now, this brings us to Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. And we might go as far as verse 4 today. It says here, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Akaliah, and it came to pass in the month of Chislu, in the 20th year, as I was in, in Sushan, the palace. Now, the month of Chislu is like November to December. So time natin, all right? November to December. Uh, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, and he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which uh, were left of the captivity concerning Jerusalem, verse 3. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in what? Great affliction and reproach. That is what's happening. That is the uh, state. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Now, we'll go to, uh, we'll go to uh, this, uh, the reaction of Ezra, uh, of Nehemiah later. But 
what happened here, remember, these people said that the walls are broken down. People are in great affliction and repro reproach because prior to this, Ezra was rallying the people, uh, uh, giving them spiritual revival. So now, Ezra did not lead the people to rebuild the wall. But because of revival, some people took initiative to start rebuilding. So now, be because of the enemy, every time they start doing or rebuilding the wall, enemy will oppose them. And again, they will stop. Right? They start building the wall, an enemy will come and oppose them, and then they will stop. Again, going to the lack of resolve that they have. Going to the lack of commitment that they have, uh, that they have uh, to the Lord. So now, now we see here that uh, these people told Nehemiah, it's, it's, it's broken down. It's not a good sight to see. It's not, it's not a place where uh, the people of God should be. Now, the people of God never moved back to Jerusalem completely because there was no wall. Right? It's important to have these walls because these walls are for a defense. The reason why these people were not really uh, confident to move into Jerusalem is because there was no wall. In, uh, they were not really confident that they can be protected there. But even though the temple was there, they were, they were worshiping there, they were doing the things that they do there, they did not really move back into the city because of the wall. Now, th because there was no wall. That's why these walls represent even our spiritual lives. That's why we need walls. We started to have this wall when we accepted Christ the Lord. He is the foundation. He's the rock. And as, as soon as we, are, and, and as we study the Word of God, as we grow, as we learn, as we mature as Christians, we are rebuilding our walls, right? Building our walls to really uh, 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 stop the devil from, from, from tempting us, not tempting us, stop the devil from tempting us to sin, from committing all these things. And now we see here that Nehemiah saw that peep, the, peep, the uh, situation of the people, that they are discouraged people, that they are people who lack resolve, that they are people who lack commitment because there was no wall. You know, if in our lives, if we don't have these walls, if we don't build on these walls, if we don't build on, on the maturing and continually growing in faith, we're going to be like these people, right. lacking resolve, right. discouraged, lacking commitment. That's why uh, these this things, parabang sa isip Nehemiah, when he heard, this should not be the attitude of the people of God. Yeah. And it's true. The people of God should not be a people who lack these things. People of God should not be people who lack commitment. People of God should not be people who lack result. You know, it is, this, we compare this to our time today. We hear news, bad news. Like uh, in, in, your country, in our country, in, in, in your countries, wherever you're from, you hear bad news, right? Whatever is happening in America it starts happening in the Philippines now. Right now, the LGBT community in the Philippines are starting to raise their voice, starting to follow what LGBT community in America is doing. Now, we know what's going to happen. The blueprint is there in America. We know what's going to happen. Now, what we need is to have resolve, to have commitment, to be able to stand and stop this kind of thing. Not only that, even the churches of God in the Philippines are being broken down. Their walls are being broken down because of apostates. Their walls are being broken down because of false teaching. Their walls are being broken down because of self-centered leadership. Now, upon hearing that news, upon knowing that news, what is your response going to be? Because the people, it seems that the people in the Philippines, people in the churches lack resolve. They lack resolve to stand up against oppressive leadership. They lack resolve to stand up against false doctrine. They lack resolve to stand up against false teachers. Why? They don't think that God can help them. They don't think that God can use any one of them to, 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 to lead, to rally the people of God into going back into the truth and building the wall of truth again. It is being broken down. That is what the devil is doing. He's penetrating the, the, uh, the church. He's penetrating the church with people who are apostates and putting them in, uh, in, in a position of leadership and breaking down the truth of the Word of God slowly in churches. Now, what should be your, res what should be your response? What should be our response to these things? Now, we see here that Nehemiah heard that these people are reproached and scorned. Right? Scorn means, uh, reproach means they are being scorned or they are being taunted. Or they are being disgraced. They're napapahiya sila. Para bang, uh, uh, para bang tinatawanan lang sila. Right? Imagine what the situation. We see the Jews, I'm not a Jew, right? We see the Jews and they start to build the wall and we shout at them a little and uh, they stop. Start to build the wall again, we show to them a sword and we, we just come by the number and they stop. 
They start to build the wall again. We make fun of them. Ah, you're never gonna, you're never gonna be able to do that. And then they stop. We're just laughing at them. These people do not have that resolve. They say that they're the people of God, but they can even build a, a wall. They lack resolve to build a wall. We just scare them off a little. They stop. They, we just, we just give them all these things a little. They stop. When they do not lack examples in their, in their community. Right, remember there was Esther, there was Ezra, these people that God are raising to revive the people. They don't lack examples. They have leaders who, can, who they can uh, uh, follow, but they don't do it. Ezra, Esther uh, uh, put her life on the line in order to save the people of God. But the people of God lack that kind of res uh, resolve. The problem is this country, whenever God raised people to, to rally them, only that person, only that leader have that kind of resolve. It seems that the, uh, the, the people as a country, as a whole, don't follow that resolve that the leader has. That is something, kaya po walang mangyayari. Kaya nga po, all these leaders or all these individual people accomplish is to preserve the people of God, not to be killed, that's all. But they were never able to rally them to rebuild the wall. They were never able to rally them to go back to Jerusalem. They were never able to rally them to go back to the promised land, to, to the blessings of the Lord again. Why? Why? Because these people are not following the resolve of those leaders. They were not. They are easily discouraged. Major, they, will, uh, they will be emotionally stirred and take up a, a shovel and, 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 do, and, and start rebuilding the wall. As soon as opposition comes, ah, we can never really do it. Stop again. God will raise up another person to encourage them. Yes, oh, God is powerful. Start rebuilding the wall. And then all of these uh, soldiers come again to stop them, scare them off. They stop again. That's what happens. And even today, spiritually, that is what's happening. We try to start standing for what's right. We try to start doing the will of God. And once we are opposed, we stop. We're scared. We're afraid. We're afraid that the devil will bring up our past. We're afraid that the devil will destroy our relationships. We're afraid that the devil will, will, will remove friends from our lives. We're afraid of all these things. We're afraid of circumstances. We don't see the God behind us. We don't see the God behind us. That's why we lack this result. That's why we lack it. You know, we notice that uh, the, the, the time that a lot of people here in this church are starting to really be active and really uh, uh, spreading all of these things, all of the things that we're studying. But once opposed, especially from a person that's important in your life, you're going to stop. Why? We're just showing that these things, these people are more important than the commitment we have for the Lord. Now, if you are going to start rebuilding the walls, if you're going to start doing the will of God, you must expect people to turn their backs on you. You must expect that. Even people who you least expect to do that, you have to expect it. Why? Because it's not easy. Because people who do not have the same resolve as you will oppose you. People who do not want you to succeed will oppose you. People who do not want you to be there, uh, to be the uh, foundation of rebuilding all these things, all these walls, will oppose you. Don't expect a happy life whenever you're starting to, to build the walls for God. Don't expect that. You're in the world. You're in the midst of idolatrous people. You're in the midst of people who do not love the Lord as much as you love the Lord. And they will oppose you. Even other brethren will oppose you. Yeah. If you start doing that. That's why uh, this is what, the, what was happening. So Nehemiah heard these things. The people of God, they lack resolve. All of these things. What was his response? Verse number four. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept. And mourn certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Right? Now, Nehemiah's uh, response was one of a broken heart. He was broken for these people. Now, we have to understand that Nehemiah never experienced the captivity. He never really. Para bang hindi, para bang tayo na lumaki sa kami nila, Cedric, lumaki kami dito sa. We grew up, me and, Cedric, and, and all these things, uh, and my sisters and Cedric, we grew up here. We, we came here at a very young age, we grew up here. We, although we're Filipinos, we didn't really grew, grow up with other, uh, we, we didn't really grow up in our country. This is what Nehemiah, this is, her, this is his uh, uh, situation. Even though he's a Jew, he was uh, uh, enjoying the, uh, well, the comfort, 
the luxury of being in the palace, of being a cupbearer, of being there, and he never really experienced this, the hardship that Israel is experiencing. He never really experienced the, uh, the, tawag dito, the captivity. So, basically, technically, he had no reason to be brokenhearted for them. No reason at all. Like, because if he was just focused on his situation, I'm enjoying, I'm in the palace, I have the favor of the king, why do I have to bother with those people? Right? Why do I have, I'm comfortable here, I'm okay here, why do I have to bother? Why do I have to be brokenhearted? Why do I have to be burdened for them? Now this is something uh, that, that can be dangerous for us spiritually. If we are complacent, if we are co too comfortable in a place, I'm okay here, I have a church, I have a job, we have air conditioning in our building, no one is stopping us from serving the Lord, why do we have to be brokenhearted for the people who don't have these things? Let's just enjoy the four corners of our church. Now that was not Nehemiah's response. His response was one of a broken heart. The Bible says that he sat down and wept and prayed. His response was prayer. Right? He, he, uh, what is, he prayed to the Lord. Now, a lot, of a lot of times when we are faced with opposition and, 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 and danger and all these things, prayer is not the first thing we go to. It's never, it's almost never the first thing we go to. The first thing we go to is we think logically. We think, what can I do? How can I battle this? How can I strike back? How can I answer them? When the default should be prayer. Sometimes we treat prayer as a special attack. Whenever we need it the most, then we, we throw it to the enemy. When that is not what the Bible is commanding us to do. The Bible is commanding us to have prayer as a way of life. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, Pray without ceasing. Colossians 4.2, Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Romans 12.12, 12, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Psalms 145, 18. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon Him, to all that call upon Him in truth. Hebrews 4, 16. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We are to pray at certain times. We are to pray immediately as need arises. And we are to make prayer a vital part of our life. It is not a special weapon that we just use whenever needed. It is a default response of a believer to pray. You're angry? Pray. You're burdened about something? Pray. You have health problems? Pray. You need a job? You pray. You need a partner in life? You pray. You have a loved one who, who has having uh, health problems? You pray. The default response of a Christian is to pray. Because that shows that we are relying on the power of our God. That shows that we are relying on the wisdom of God and not our own. Most of the times we trust ourselves too much. Especially those who are ultra spiritual people who think that they can do a lot for they have done a lot for god already they don't need him anymore because they already have the experience they stop praying right people who think that uh they are very intellectual they stop praying when they're faced with a problem they go to the drawing board think of logical things how logical ways to to really solve this problem when god is just there waiting for us to ask for help don't treat prayer that way now nehemiah upon hearing that news he prayed he prayed to the Lord. Not only did he pray, the Bible says he mourned, he fasted, he wept. It's not bad to cry. He was burdened. Now, this is something we see that this is a heavy burden that he felt. When technically he doesn't have really the experience to, to, to just be brokenhearted for these people. But he did. You know, God gave us a commission. God gave us a command. To go into all the world and preach the gospel and to make sure that everyone hears the gospel of Christ. We are here in Shimri. What are we doing in order to make sure that the gospel of Christ is reaching other people? Are we burdened whenever we hear a missionary asking for prayer? Are we burdened whenever we, we, we hear that a missionary has a problem? You know, if, if, you, if you are friends with uh, Pastor John Schrader, missionary to Zambia, now he has back problems, he needs spinal surgery, he went back to the States, uh, uh, leaving his family of 15, 13 children, something like that. Uh, they're back there in, uh, in, in Zambia waiting for it, but, but he has these problems. Are you, whenever you read those news on Facebook, are you broken hearted for them? Do you pray for them? 
Do you have this, uh, this heart for souls that even though you have not been there, you have a heart for them? That even though you have not been to a certain land, you have this burden that they might hear the gospel of Christ. That's why we have missions program. That's why we're supporting these missionaries so that in a way, we can be a part of that. So that in a way, by praying and supporting, we can be a part of that. Now, Nehemiah, he did not, he, he, haven't, he hasn't even seen Jerusalem. He hasn't even seen it with his own eyes. But he was already so brokenhearted that when he heard the news, he just broke down and cried and prayed to the Lord. Now, my question to you this morning is, what makes you break down and cry? What makes, you, what makes your heart be broken? What gives you burden? You know, sometimes we cry only because our favorite sports team lost. Right? We cry because we're watching Korean drama. You cry for that. We cry because our favorite love team in the Philippines got separated. Uh, they got divorced, uh, like Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt. We cry, right? We cry because we have a pet who died. Uh, we cry because we didn't get something we want. We cry because we got offended by the preaching. We cry because we get emotional by listening to a sad song. Now, this is how shallow Christians are today. When you see what made Nehemiah cry was hearing the people of God in bondage and he had a burden for them. Do we have that kind of thing? What makes you break down and cry? What gives you that burden? Ano po yung importante sa buhay natin? Is it the will of God? Whenever we hear Christians in the Philippines being taken advantage of by these self-centered leaders, do we get burdened because of that? Or do we just not care? I'm enjoying my life here. I don't have to be burdened for it. I don't have to do anything. I am comfortable. I don't want to be uncomfortable because of that. Now, Nehemiah is preparing himself to be uncomfortable. He's comfortable in the palace. He has a great job. Uh, he has privileges, but he knows that if I start on this path, I will live my life of comfort. I will live the life I'm in, I will live the life that I'm enjoying right now. I'm, I will live the privileges that I'm enjoying right now. But the burden of God that, that God has placed in my heart is so great that this comfort means nothing to me. As long as I'm, I know that the people of God are being reproached. I know that the people of God are being burdened. I know that the people of God, are. Uh, this is happening to them. Now, what are we burdened about? What do we cry about? Do you cry for your loved ones who are not saved? Are you willing to do anything for them to be saved? Do you cry for your loved ones who are being deceived? Are you willing to do anything for them to come to know the truth? Are you willing to do that? Because the thing is, we put ourselves first. We put our comfort first. We put our life first. We put our goals first. We put our will first. When we, when, when we, we are expected to do is to read the Word of God, to know what's happening around us, to pray about it, to be burdened about it, and to sacrifice ourselves to make a way for, this to, uh, for, for, things, to hap for things to be fixed. Now, we know that the world is going to get worse. We know that. We know that things is, are getting worse. Now, uh, all of these things in the Philippines is, is going to start to get worse now. We know what's going to happen. They're gonna, one one uh, guy or girl, whatever he or she it is, will stand up and speak up for LGBTQ community, right? And then everyone, all of those communities will get stirred up and they're going to rally and they're going to have a resolve that we don't have and they're going to fight the government and they're going to fight the Christians and they're going to fight for their rights in order for the, for the country to be turned around and, and to compromise for them. You know, sometimes they have more resolve than us. Yeah. Don't you realize that? They have more resolve than us when they are not the ones in the truth. Now, people who lack resolve, who are discouraged, who are not committed, you expect that from unbelievers. Why? They don't have the truth. They don't have the foundation that is laid in Christ Jesus. They don't have the truth of the Word of God. They should be the ones who lack resolve. But no, what's happening today is Christians who know the Bible, who know, who has a foundation, who knows the truth, they are the ones who lack resolve to battle error. That is something that is sad to think of today. I don't know. Whenever, if, if someone will challenge your faith, are you willing to stand up and fight for it? If someone will challenge what you believe, are you willing to stand up, use the Word of God and fight for it? And, and really stand for it? And, and not care if you're going to be uncomfortable? And not care if you're going to be left alone? And not care if you're going to lose a lot of friends? Are you willing to do that? The Bible says, who shall not hate mother and father is not worthy of me. The Bible says, if you want to follow me, you have to forsake 
everything. That includes your friends. That includes your family and follow me if they're not going to follow me with you. Are you willing to do that? Where, you remember when, when uh, these two disciples, I forgot their names, uh, when they asked Christ, to, can you please place us in your right hand and your left hand in the coming kingdom? What, did, what is Christ's response to them? Are you ready to drink of my cup of suffering? Are you ready? Are you ready to suffer for me? If so, sure. But if you're not, don't even dare. Don't even try. That's why uh, uh, my challenge to you this morning, and we're just going to take all these four verses, is my challenge to you is what resolve do you have? What burden did Christ place in your heart? What is that thing that sh you should be ready to lose friends, to lose family, to lose comfort for? I hope that you know it. And I hope that before doing anything about it, you pray. I hope that before doing anything about it, you ask the Lord's wisdom. I know I pray that before doing anything about it, you make sure that the things that you're going to do, the steps that you're going to take is the will of God for your life. Because if we do it rashly, because if we do it without praying, because if we do it without the wisdom of God, we are just setting up ourselves to fail. That's why if you have the resolve, you know it, you heard, you heard the burden, God placed a burden in your heart, pray. Later on, we're going to see how long Nehemiah waited before doing something. He waited for a long time, prayed and waited for a long time before even doing something about it. Waiting on the Lord, waiting for the Lord to answer, to give you the steps to take. We see that in the life of Paul. Paul will not do anything unless he's sure that it's God's will. Remember, he said, I wanted to go here, to go to Asia to preach, but God said, no, uh, to Macedonia, no, you will not go there. That is not what I'm calling you. Uh, I forgot. I might have, have it reversed. That's not what I'm telling you to do. The Holy Spirit led him to so somewhere else. Every step he took was he was waiting on the Lord to move him. He was waiting on the Lord to, to, to guide him to somewhere. You know, sometimes... We are so, we, we make our life so uh, mystical or parabang uh, na yon. Na para ba pag may nangyari, ah, I think God wants me to do this. Ah, I think this is not God's will for me. Without even praying about it. Right? Uh, I got fired from the job. Ah, God wants me to go back to the Philippines. I got, uh, uh, I got dumped. Ah, oh, this might not be God's will for me. We we get we do we do our decisions, make our decisions based on circumstances, based on what we are feeling, based on what uh, our emotion is dictating us, without even praying and waiting on the Lord to answer our prayer. This is Nehemiah. What did he do upon hearing the bad news? He wept. He cried. He prayed. He fasted. And waited on the Lord. I hope and I pray that first we are going to put our burdens in the right place. Put our burdens in the right place. Don't be burdened by petty things. Don't be emotionally driven by things of this world. Be emotionally driven or burdened by the things of God. By what's happening in our country. By what's happening with our people. Be burdened by that. And pray to the Lord that God will use us and ask the Lord the steps to take, that we have to take. And, and hopefully we'll be able to continue on uh, uh, learning and see the prayer of Nehemiah and see what he did, see what God led him to do and learn from that. Let us uh, go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, this morning for uh, this... Uh